Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. We are here in Reno, Nevada at the famous Nugget Casino and Convention Center for Tailhook 22. And my guest today is retired Admiral Bill Gortney, an old shipmate of mine. Absolutely. Uh, Shortney, for those uh, of, of our listeners who uh, don't know his bio, Shortney was a A7 F-18 pilot, over 5,000 uh, uh, air hours, uh, over 1,200 carrier arrested landings. He commanded... Thir- thir- 1,300 oh, 1,300. I, so your bio, three. Thirteen. your bio says 1,263 or something like that. But oh, well, maybe that's what it is. Okay. Yeah, 1,263. Right. A lot of a lot of traps, a lot of cats and traps in his uh, in his lifetime. He's been retired for about uh, six, six years. years now. Yep. He uh, commanded VFA 15, a strike fighter squadron, VFA 106, the East Coast RAG. He commanded Carrier Air Wing 7. He commanded uh, the Carrier Strike Group, the Truman Strike Group. And I spent a little time with you on Truman back in uh, 2007, yep. eight time frame. He commanded Fifth Fleet, he commanded Fleet Forces Command, and then he commanded U.S. Northern Command, uh, from which he retired about six years ago. NORAD, and, North, Nor- NORAD NORTHCOM. NORAD NORTHCOM. And, yeah. and, uh, and Shortney is the chairman of the uh, Tailhook Association. So, Shortney, great to have you on the show. Well, Goat, thanks for having me. A lot of excitement stuff, exciting stuff here at <clears throat> Tailhook. Nobody's wearing masks this year, which is great, so we're out of COVID. Lots of JOs here, lots of lots of chatter. There was a great conversation yesterday about the making of, of uh, Top Gun Maverick, and it was the Navy side of the perspective, so all the Navy advisors and pilots and every, everybody that was involved with it, which was terrific. Uh, so, so what's exciting from your perspective as the chairman of Tailhook? You know, what are the big things that, you know, were, were in the making of, of Hook 22 and uh, still yet to come? Well, you know, it's uh, our largest tail hook ever. Um, wow. Ever. Uh, we think we cracked uh, 4,000 uh, uh, guests here, uh, and, and that's huge. We had the largest number of exhibitors uh, who, who are, you know, there's, we, have, we have four types of members uh, at tail hook. We have civilians, very, very small number. We have active duty, we have retired, and we have corporate. And, um, uh, and so with that combination, about over 4,000, largest number of corporate exhibitors that we've had ever sold out immediately as soon as we open it up for it. And uh, what's really neat is just to see how things are so different than they used to be. And I'll leave it at that, except for, you know, uh, as I'm walking around uh, through Tailhook, I realize that we have to get babysitters um, the next year because we have so many families that show up. Uh, which is really cool. Yeah. And it, the great thing is that the primes that have simulators, we have a lot of simulators here, uh, and and you go up to see if you want to fly a, you know, the F-35 simulator, you, you can't get in it because there's a 10-year-old flying the simulator, and you you can't kick a 10-year-old out of a simulator, you know? No. So it's really neat. So we're working with, uh, again, the, the legends, our retired group, the legends, that the giants that we stood on their, sh- uh, stand on their shoulders. Uh, our future, our active duty, a lot of junior officer representation, uh, active duty flags. We have 37 flags. Uh, CNO um, uh, is our guest speaker tonight. He's been here for two full days. It's really terrific to have him. I was with him last night, and the JOs were coming up and uh, thanking him for being there. It was, it was really huge. And he's our guest speaker tonight at, at the banquet. So it's, uh, it's fun, and uh, uh, we continue to evolve. Uh, but we've got great staffs uh, 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 run by uh, Chaser Keeley, runs Tailhook Association, and another old shipmate of yours and mine, the Tailhook Educational Foundation, uh, is run by uh, Roger Welsh. Yep. And, and the two of them working side by side uh, have really taken both our companies, both, both corporations, uh, to the next level. And, it's, and, it, and this, is, uh, this is a terrific thing. We really want to thank the Nugget, who does terrific work for us here. Um, there could be other places where we might want to go, but we own the battle space here, yeah. and you understand the importance of that because we do fill it up uh, uh, with everybody here. So it's neat. It's yeah, yeah. So there's a lot going on in naval aviation these days. So we got Super Hornets, we got Growlers, we got the MQ-25 unmanned refueling platform coming down the pike pretty soon. Got Ford with emails. Um, you know, there's 
new weapons coming online that we can't talk about, but there's a lot happening in naval aviation. Mm -hmm. what, what are the most exciting things in your perspective uh, as a former naval aviator, stuff that you wish you were still flying to take advantage of? Well, first off, um, you know, I walked up to a lot of junior officers last night and I told them I'd swap places with them right then and there. Uh, I, I, except for I wouldn't swap Sherry in my ski boat. But, but um, uh, it's, it's really neat. Their future's gonna be terrific. You know, in the last uh, 15 years, uh, naval aviation has recapitalized 100% of naval aviation into new platforms. And uh, I applaud naval aviation leadership in that period of time because they did it within their budget, their own, uh, we call it TOA. Uh, and now the newer platforms, uh, the next generation of of platforms are coming in. A very, very successful deployment for the Navy on Vinson with, with the F-35C, yep. uh, the E-2D, and of course the, uh, the CMV-22, uh, which is really, really neat. And what's coming next, uh, Block 3 uh, Block three F-18s, which is a, a real step change in modernization and capability that's gonna add to that particular platform. So I'm excited about the future uh, for the Navy and naval aviation. Follow-on programs, uh, uh, the NJAD family of systems uh, uh, next. I, I, I think it's uh, naval aviation has done a great job in the past and will continue to to do great in the future. And, and, I, and I miss it every day. Yeah, follow-on to that NJAD comment, right? So sixth generation, do you think NJAD's going to be manned, unmanned, optionally manned? What, what do you think is coming for next generation? Well, you know, NJAD is really more than just a single platform. It's a family, family of systems. MQ-25, um, uh, uh, potentially uh, autonomous uh, vehicles that, that you can control, manned-on-man -man teaming, and, and a platform. And I, I, I would predict that uh, NJAD, the manned platform, will just be manned platform. Okay. You know, there's a lot of talk of autonomy, uh, AI, um, but at the end of the day, the technology uh, to make an autonomous system that, it, that can execute based on commander's intent and not be controlled from, uh, by, by some means, communication back to a, to a human being on a control station that can just go off and do what, what manned aircraft do, uh, it's, it's just not there. And so until that happens, uh, the man in the loop's gonna have to be there. The man, uh, the man or woman in the cockpit is gonna, gonna have to be there. Um, you know, I quoted years ago that I thought F-35 would be the last manned platform that, that we flew. Yeah. Um, but of course we fly our airplanes for 40 to 50 years, variants of them, so that's a long time off. But that technology that, that we give a, give a platform a mission and send it on its way, and it, and it executes commander's intent and can make judgment and change uh, based on commander's intent, change mission to execute the mission. Uh, quite frankly, there's only uh, one platform that can do that, and it's one with a man or a woman in the cockpit. Wetware between the ears. Between the ears, yeah. 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 And, and so uh, I see that as uh, the manned piece of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of NJAD, um, uh, and then there'll be manned-on-man -man teaming uh, with the other with the other platforms, got it. Which yeah. expands our sensor capability, weapons loads, whole lot of capabilities that are out there. Once the technology comes on, that we can figure out how to do that. Cool. And industry will figure out how to do that. So the theme of this year's tailhook is 100 years of carrier aviation. It's been 100 years since the the Collier Jupiter was converted to the USS Langley, the first carrier. Mm -hmm. Eugene Eli, you know, first uh, arrested landing and, and take off, yeah. right? Uh, so 100 years of, of manned carrier aviation. What's one of your favorite stories? Well, first off, you know, it's 100 years. 2022, subtract um, 1978 for me. Do the public math, because I'm a oh history major. I'm Fifth, a history major and I can't do it. 45 years, I think? Yeah. Yeah. Well, guess what? That was when you were commissioned my, and started flying? I got flying. my first trap uh, okay. on the USS Lexington in the T2 Buckeye. So, you know, if, that really puts it in perspective that yeah. it's been 100 years. And you look at the, uh, the technological advances from Langley to Ford and Kennedy and Enterprise. It, it's amazing. It is absolutely yeah. amazing. And nu then, Nuclear power, emails, advanced radars. You know, it's, crews it's, of five, you know, four or five thousand people on a carrier, right? right? Um, and you look at, 
you know, our carriers last 50 years. You know, there's a debate. What are we going to do with Nimitz? Well, that was, Nimitz was my first ship. Um, and so for my first two deployments. But what's amazing is, is also the evolution of the air wing. Because uh, uh, we really, the reason the carrier's relevant is because we modernized the air wing. Yep. And you look at the different type model series uh, that first flew from Langley that are going to be flying, you know, for the next next 75 years at least yep. uh, from the flight deck, and the modernization of the airplanes that we just talked about. So uh, it's just uh, the future's exciting. And, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of debate about the aircraft carrier. And uh, and it's a t and it's embarked air wing, its survivability, all of all of the debates that you all do a great job in Naval Institute write about. But at the end of the day, um, it's all about the money. They want our money. They want it, it. It's not a capability based discussion. It's not a fact based discussion, because uh, at the, at at. At the end of the day, in a crisis, we, the Navy and the Marine Corps sailed a crisis. Yep. And as soon as they arrive, they bring credible combat power, the Navy and Marine Corps bring credible combat power to bear to make the potential adversary blink and de-escalate the crisis, or we are able to escalate, if it escalates, and use that credible combat power to open the battle space to bring on a follow-on joint force. And, and um, as, it, as long as we're 12.1 12, 12 miles away from that coastline, we have the most survivable airstrip uh, in the world, which is an aircraft carrier. It's a moving target. You know, I drop bombs for a living. They're a lot easier to hit when they don't move, right? Tar <laughs> right. Targets are. And our story is um, the truth. And all we have to do is tell our story in a truthful and factual manner, which is what we do, Thanks to the thanks to proceedings, Naval Institute. That's one of our uh, uh, people that tell that story. And when that story is no longer the truth, then and that's not that's not what really happens. Well, then then we have to adapt our Navy. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that's going to be a long time from now because there's we we bring we bring our own capability. We're waterfront property. You never sell waterfront property, uh, and we can go anywhere they are, wherever the world is, to, to, to make the sale to crisis. That's really what we are. I like to say we're a crisis response force. We really are. We're sized for uh, uh, forward presence. It's a core mission of the United States Navy is forward presence. We're sized for that. We're budgeted for that. Um, uh, that, that that's our primary mission is that crisis response to do sea control to do power projection. So uh, our, our CEO Pete Daly says hi by the way. Yeah. Um, and one of the things he, he likes friend. to bring up uh, in the comment of the discussion about aircraft carriers right is the 2014 ISIS is on the steps of Baghdad and the only way we can get air power on that problem set is from a US aircraft carrier because Getting Air Force, you know, in in country, in region, with permission from allies and, and partners to to do airstrikes into Iraq and into Syria, uh, took sixty odd days. That's correct. Right. So that's a, a great example of sail the crisis. You own the water space, uh, and you can operate from there without having to ask a lot of permission. Yeah, the, the key part of that. That's a great example of what I call. Uh, we bring our own physical and political access. Access comes in physical access, which is where do you land, where do you take off from, what, how do you sustain yourself. Yep. And the other one is political access, which includes where you want to do that permanent or temporary basing and permission to use their airspace, fly through their airspace, et cetera. So the, United, the Navy and the Marine Corps bring our own, the National Command Authority, physical and political access, and no other part of the joint force does that. No part. Yeah. And, uh, and and that's that's the key piece, which is why, you know, when, when they say, when the president says, where's the aircraft carriers, that's why. They don't have to ask permission to, uh, to, to employ credible combat, to put credible combat power for deterrence, to make them blink, or then, or to execute to hostilities execute. and right. bring in the follow-on joint force. Right. Right. And this is a cyclical story that goes back since, you know, you were flying yeah. uh, off Les Lexington, right? Uh, retention right now, the job market in the civilian world is hot, uh, the airlines are hiring again, 
And so JO retention is a, is a problem for naval aviation. It's an issue, right? right? And I've talked to some JOs out here. We've had some that have written in proceedings. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? What's being done? What, what are you hearing from JOs? And what are you hearing from senior leaders about how to address that problem of getting the JOs to stay on for department head tours, the DHs to stay on for COXO and, and follow on tours? Well, Goat, I'm really glad you asked that question because um, retention's a hobby of mine. Okay? And when I was in my first squadron, my commanding officer was my detailer. And in every one of my commands, the people that were direct reports to me, I was their detailer. We didn't talk to the Goombas from Millington, <laughs> right? Um, I talked to them, they didn't. Okay. And uh, there's, there's a myth out there, uh, and I wanna, put the, I wanna put to bed one of the myths. Okay. Naval aviation has the highest retention of any, any one of the branches in the United States Navy. Really? Yes. Okay? There's, there's billets in the Navy that are not coded to aviator, surface warriors, EOD. Yeah. And uh, those are, I, I forget what the code is, uh, 1100 or something like that. And we are actually have uh, authority to exceed our end strength, aviation end strength, 1310, 13, 1320s, uh, because we fill those billets that can go to any unrestricted line officer. Okay. That the other communities can't fill. So, um, uh, you know, one of the reasons I think we have uh, a high retention that, that is cyclic yeah. um, is because uh, we have a great mission and, uh, and, it, and it's fun. Not every day is fun. Right. You know, heart is authorized, but we have fun. We're a great family. We have a great mission. We have great products. We have a, we, we, um, a relevant mission. I mean, how long were we in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq? How many years? 20 years. 20 yeah, years. Right. Well, there's only three communities that were in combat for those 20 years. Our SEALs, our EOD, and naval aviation. Okay? We actually tend to stay in more than the other communities. Interesting. Despite having the longest uh, from uh, it, uh, from training to designation, the right. longest that street, agreement street to fleet that was being the longest about agreement to remain. You know, so if there's a uh, a young uh, 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 ensign that wants to go jets, that's a ten year commitment. Yeah, it's eight year, two, winging plus eight years. That's correct. Yeah, and at least a ten year commitment. And um, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that graduate from ROTC or the Naval Academy that uh, are, are, are on the five and outs plan, yep. you know? So the, 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 these kids are committing to 10 years of their life. Now they think that's a long time, boy, right. it's not so long. It's not, anyway, yeah. but um, uh, so that, that's, let, let's put that myth to bed. The next thing is to remember is, you know, I'm, I'm second generation Naval officer, Naval aviator. My father was a NAVCAD in World War II, night fighter pilot, uh, first, one of the first jet squadron in, uh, in Korea. Um, uh, uh, on the first jet deployment, Vietnam uh, and the Cold War. So World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the Cold War. Wow. And and you know, so so Gortney's wore khakis for a long time. And uh, we have always had a retention problem because of the airlines. Yep. Okay. And and the 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 things that uh, active duty leadership can do to affect that, quite frankly, are on the fringes, right? Because retention, since it's a hobby of mine, really comes down to, a, to three issues. A lot of these people, when they're on the stay in, get out list, what do they want to do? Uh, comes down to that they want to go do something else. Uh -huh. You know, uh, we got a lot of lawyers, we got a lot of doctors. Uh, uh, they want to go out and start their own business. You know, there's something else that that uh, they, they serve their nation and they want to go do something else yep. to follow their, their passion. The second issue is um, uh, the fleet's hard work. Yes, it is. Okay? And um, there are uh, some dissatisfiers. When I was a young J.O., night carrier landings were really hard for me, but I had good leadership that, like, that worked me through it. But um, as great as Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick is, and as, as close as Top Gun Maverick, uh, uh, we think, captured the, uh, the fleet, it's hard work, okay? Uh, and, and, it, and it requires a work ethic uh, and, and, a, and a sense of purpose and a sense of mission 
that uh, is pretty hard. And some people say, you know, I love it. I loved what I did, but maybe the third issue then comes into play, and that's family separation. Yeah. So, you know, we recruit the individual sailor, we retain the family. Uh, deployments, long deployments are a part of our life. Uh, when I grew up, my dads were 12 months long, and uh, it wasn't much fun. And uh, so family separation is a huge issue, and families that don't want to, can't deal with the family separation. So if it's a, they, if there's something in the fleet that they can't do, that number two, uh, night traps in my case or something, or the, or the work ethic required, or family separation, there's nothing that we can do to change their mind on, on those particular issues. Yeah. And if you're a 1310, if you're a pilot, there's always an alternative uh, out there is to go fly for the airlines. So, um, so, you know, is the grass greener on the other side? I will tell you we have a lot of airline pilots that come to Tailhook every year because they miss the camaraderie, the ready room, the sense of purpose, the sense of mission. Yeah. So again, leadership is works every pulls every lever that they can, and and they and and uh, this current group of leaders will lead their way through this uh, retention problem, which is not as bad as it was before 9/11. Interesting. We were hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging before 9/11, and the only thing that saved us, the only thing that has ever turned the pilot retention uh, numbers around has been a national crisis. So before COVID, uh, uh, Sherry and I were helping Ellen and Bullet Miller with a JO symposium that was a week long. And, and Sherry uh, and Ellen, Sherry was helping Ellen with the spouses and I was helping Bullet with the, uh, the air boss at the time with the JOs. And, um, and we had this discussion yep. about the stay in and get out. And I said, look, the only thing that's ever turned the tide is a national is a national emergency, and quite frankly, I'd rather have a pilot retention problem than another national emergency. Amen. Yeah, okay. Good point. So we'll so, lead our way through it. Yeah. Uh, so time for one last question. Uh, Two thousand seven eight, you were the Truman Strike Group commander. I was uh, spent some time on board uh, helping your Intel team get ready for deployment yeah. as part of the Card Group Four staff, CSG Four staff. And uh, during one of those underways, you had the commander, the CNO equivalent of the Chinese Navy, Admiral yeah. Wu Shang Li, come yeah. out. Admiral Wu. Admiral Wu. So he comes out to Truman, and you didn't have a whole lot of guidance from above, because I remember talking to you, but you were like, I'm going to show him, I'm going to put on a show, of an air power, firepower demonstration that, that shows him that he does not want to tangle with the U.S. Navy. That's correct. So fast forward 15 years. China is part of the national defense strategy now. It's talked about in the panels out here. It's, it's you know, in proceedings every month. We've got something about China and what, what the Chinese military, their buildup, their capabilities, all that stuff. So your thoughts on, on that uh, peer level competitor now and what we have to do, what the priorities need to be for the U.S. Navy, naval aviation for the next you know, five, 10 years. The PLA, in this case, the PLAN, they're putting to see a pretty capable, uh, what looks to be a pretty capable Navy. Uh, what I'm not entirely certain of is, um, uh, you know, what's under the good looking ships. I, I, uh, I know you've read Shattered Sword. Mm -hmm. um, that, that the best part of Shattered Sword is the comparison of how Japanese naval aviation evolved prior, prior to World War II and how the US Navy naval aviation evolved and then how, how both uh, navies uh, viewed damage control, firefighting, um, uh, mitigation procedures for combat damage, things of that nature. Uh, and it, it, it leads the reader uh, through those differences and then, in the, and then in the battle, how those differences played out on the outcome uh, of, of Midway. And, um, and so at the end of the day, I'd really like to understand, because we don't, I think, have a full understanding. What's their damage control? What's their firefighting? How resilient are their ships? Uh, you know, we build resilient ships, and we build resilient sailors. Yeah, we build sailors who are damage control experts. Every, and everybody, yeah. every sailor on a, on a ship is a firefighter. Yep. And um, so what is, and, and the whole ship is designed to be able to, to uh, take hits, all our ships designed to take hits and continue to fight. 
I don't know what theirs is like. I, I mean, um, I haven't been on one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we felt the same way about the Soviet Navy. We painted them 10 feet tall, and when right. we finally got on their ships, we realized they weren't that good. Yeah. Well, and, and the Moskva went down pretty quickly in the yeah. Black Sea a couple months ago. That's right? correct. Yeah. So, so, um, so we'll have to see. But as you mentioned uh, uh, about Admiral Wu's visit, you know, uh, we want the, uh, I think the leadership, when I was on active duty, and I know the leadership today, wants the PLAN, their Navy, to wake up every morning and say, today is not the Today's day not we the want day. to pick, the, pick, pick a fight with the United States Navy. Yep. Um, the, uh, you know, we take a lot of, we, we, we don't talk a lot about how um, uh, we intend to, to um, uh, uh, deny and deceive and uh, defeat our, our, our enemy uh, because we don't want them to know. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and so, and the Navy, you know, we are, you know, you really think about it, the United States Air Force, the United States Navy, we're a very, both services are very technologically advanced and really push technology. Uh, and so uh, I don't want the American people to think that the United States Navy is sitting on its backside uh, and think and, and cede battle space to the enemy. We'll never cede battle space to the enemy. We'll fight them in a, in a place and a time of our choosing and, uh, and, and we will prevail. I have, I have, I have no, no question about that. Um, I don't know about um, when that will occur. I actually, uh, I actually believe it, it. I believe it probably won't be a, 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 a Taiwan uh, uh, focused event. I think it'll be um, a dust up in the South China Sea. Yep. So again, for the readers, I'd recommend them read Asia's Cauldron, another great book, um, recommended by Admiral Harry Harris, a good friend of mine, when he was the PACOM commander. Um, uh, that it'll be a crisis. We don't understand each other's red lines. It'll be a third party uh, crisis, maybe Philippines, Vietnam, something. Because we don't understand each other's red lines, we'll be drug into, uh, drug into the fight. Um, It'll be predominantly maritime uh, and air in focus without a lot of press conferences. But fundamentally, that's what's in Asia's cauldron. And both sides are going to want to de-escalate quickly because mm -hmm. we, neither side wants to go to war. Yep. Right? Neither side wants to go to war. But uh, uh, if you look in history, um, a lot of countries said they didn't want to go to war, but oh, they ended up going to war. Ended up going to war. Uh, right. for, uh, stumbling into it. Stumbling right. into it. Another good book, uh, War of Necessity, War of Choice. You know, o OEF was a war of necessity, OIF was a war of choice. Yep. I don't see this being a war of choice, personally. Bill Gordon is an American taxpayer. Yep. Um, so we'll just have to see, but uh, I want to assure the American people, I have confidence in the United States Navy to be able to do its missions. Well, Shortney, thanks for being on the show. It's been great to, great to be here at, at Hook 22. As always, a great event, and uh, great to see you and connect with old shipmates. Thanks, Go. And, Appreciate uh, it. Yeah, good luck with the rest of the show. Okay. So uh, for our listeners, until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.